Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ardun, thank you for introducing me. Thank you for bringing me here. He I said to him, I have a lecture till 12 in Copenhagen. How can I be at three in Sweden? But I had got the geography somewhat wrong and didn't realize that 40 minutes across the bridge would get me here. It's also a pleasure to meet my old friend, Per Fliesberg, who worked in our department for four years. Nice to see you again. And he will remember, this is why I use a slide background, this is a sunset over the Indian Ocean because Western Australia looks towards the west. So where the sun sets is Johannesburg, the next city, around, I don't know, about 8,000 kilometers across the water. But we have really sensational sunsets. So acute pain after surgery, what have we learned in the last years? Very briefly, my disclosures of Conflicts of interest, uh, professors at the University of Western Australia are not permitted to take private income from anybody, so everything goes to the university department. We do lots of research for nearly every company involved in anything to do with pain, so I think you reduce bias by working for all of them, and I hope I will give you a very unbiased presentation. The reason I think why Ordon asked me to come here is that the International Association for the Study of Pain has made 2017 the global year against pain after surgery. I don't know how many of you were running activities in your hospitals about improving pain relief after surgery, but I was now in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, because we all were run all over Asia, these campaigns in the context of the global year. If you are more interested in some of the details, there is a website of the ISP, which has also very interesting fact sheets. Ordun also alluded to this book, which was 18 months of my last five years of my life, because we tried to see through the whole scientific evidence on acute pain management, and I was the chairman of the committee which updated this to 2015. Uh, the reason that I present it to you is because the College of Anesthetists of Australia and New Zealand makes it free for everybody, so you only have to go to this website and you can actually download the PDF, and the PDF can fit on your iPad or whatever, or you can even tick a box there and for 20 Australian dollars, which is, for, I think, in Swedish money, very little money, you actually get the book because you only have to pay the printing costs. The book is very big. We analyzed 8,600 references to complete it. We, the book is very big, 647 Pages. I advise against printing the PDF because your printer will get very exhausted by doing that. But you can print the first 45 pages or so because these contain 669 key messages with levels of evidence. And really, if you are not very interested in the scientific background, then reading the key messages is actually enough. The book was initially intended for Australia and New Zealand, but within a very short time, was adapted all around the world, including the International Association for the Study of Pain here and its special interest group, Acute Pain, of which I am the chairman at the moment, and for example, ESRA, the European Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Therapy. I didn't see a Swedish organization there, but that might just be a random event. So what is the main message? I think when we analyze everything which is currently available, possibly then the main message is that Nothing has changed, that opioids are very effective analgesics. They are necessary to provide pain relief in many situations with severe pain, and that's as well after surgery as after trauma. But at the same time, opioids have lots of problems. And the biggest problem is opioid-induced ventilatory impairment, which is actually a new term which Australia is trying to introduce because we feel opioid-reduced respiratory or opioid-induced respiratory depression is only attacking one point because we have airway obstruction and respiratory depression as the reasons for potentially fatal outcomes and therefore OIVI is in our opinion a better description. So this is dangerous and we know that for example in the US with promotion of more aggressive post-operative analgesia there was a dramatic increase, I think sevenfold of respiratory arrests on surgical wards because people tried to treat pain aggressively and got more and more problems. But the other issue which is by far more relevant and I know Henry Kehlet is here running an ERAS meeting in parallel is that if you have nausea, vomiting, constipation and urinary retention as the classical consequences of opioids then you're actually delaying recovery by people, patients can't eat and drink, patients have no bowel movement, patients need catheters, 
And if you look at sedation, confusion, and agitation, one has to realize that if you want to get people early out of bed and mobilizing, you cannot do that with a patient who has these impairment. And overall, there are quite significant data suggesting that opioid-related adverse events increase lengths of stay and costs of hospital. And therefore, there is a key message, and this is how the key messages in the book look. I've just taken a few out, which says the incidence of clinically meaningful adverse events in opioids is dose-related. The more opioid, the more. And this is S for strengthened. So five years ago, it was not such a strong message. And level one means it is systematic review or meta-analysis. So for every of these key messages, you will see how have they improved or deteriorated over the last five years since the last edition and what is actually the current level of evidence. On the basis of that realization that those related adverse effects are so potentially harmful for the recovery of our patients. You remember that your own Henry Kalek proposed around 20 years ago a word which was initially balanced post-operative analgesia and then became multimodal post-operative analgesia. And what is this? It is the combination of analgesics with different mode of side of action. And if you use it right, then you improve pain control, you reduce opioid consumption, the famous opioid sparing effect, and as opioid side effects are those related, you are reducing adverse effects. And that's really possibly the mantra of post-operative pain relief work. Now, how does it work in practice? I've just picked one random study of the many, many. This is a study where patients had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. They got a PCA pump with morphine, and then they were randomized between 40 milligrams paracoxid twice daily and placebo twice daily. And when they compared the paracoxib with the placebo group, the paracoxib group used 30% less morphine, opioid sparing effect. They had nevertheless significantly less pain. And as well as the severity of opioid side effects as the number of clinically meaningful opioid side effects was significantly reduced. And that's really what multimodal analgesia can do. Now, this is not only an idea of the crazy Australians and New Zealanders. There is a nice parallel guideline which was published a year later. It's much shorter, based on much less literature. It's by the American Pain Society, ASRA, and ASA. And they say pretty much the same. The panel recommends that clinicians offer multimodal analgesia, a variety of analgesic medications and techniques combined. And they say this is a strong recommendation with high quality evidence. Now, to get a little bit of order into multimodal analgesia, I like the map of our pain pathways. So if you look at the map, then we have initially the transduction, where the physical stimuli are getting nociceptors to fire action potentials. And we know that we can interfere here with a number of our drugs, including getting our surgeons to infiltrate the area of incision, incision or troca insertion. Once we have the action potential traveling, then we are the anesthetists who are perfectly trained to do a conduction and transmission block, either in the periphery or close to the norexias, for example, as an epidural block. And finally, really over the last 10 to 15 years, we have understood that the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is a major processing site for pain information. And a lot of it is under excitatory and inhibitory pathway and we can actually influence this in favor of reduced pain with a number of substances which are interfering with modulation to finally lead to the perception where opioids in particular change not the pain if you ask patients, but the patients say it doesn't bother me anymore. So it's a perception change what opioids do in the brain. Now the underlying <coughs> me mechanism to all of that, if you look into this map, is that we have normally a stimulus response curve for pain. So we have a threshold, then increasing stimuli above the threshold will cause more and more pain. And the thing is that every time a surgeon cuts into a human being, or you break a leg, or have a car accident, your curve will move to the right, left, because injury causes a peripheral and central sensitization of our nociceptive system. And as a consequence, the same stimulus, which was 1 out of 10, after the injury is now 9 out of 10 pain, 
Hence, there is an area under the curve where there was no pain before, which was sub-threshold, which is now supra-threshold. And these are called hyperalgesia and allodynia, as you know, and both of these phenomena occur by central and peripheral sensitization. And people haven't realized until the last 15 years that within of minutes after any injury, we have central sensitization processes in our spinal cord. Now, what does that mean? That means to me that if we use anti-hyperalgesic drugs, drugs which are either changing peripheral sensitization or central sensitization, NSAIDs and COXIPs for peripheral, for example, or gabapentin, pregabalin, ketamine for central sensitization, we are moving the curve back. We have still no drug to move the curve back completely, but what happens is that your pain stimulus, which was one before the injury, nine after the injury, is now seven after they've used an anti hyperalgesic drug. If you now want to treat the remaining pain with an opioid, before your antihyperalgesics, you would need this amount of opioid. After the antihyperalgesic, you would only need this amount of opioid. And this is an opioid sparing effect for which we find that for most substances we have currently available, we get something between 30 and 40% of opioid sparing effect. There is currently level one evidence, again, if you go through our guidelines, for the following components of multimodal analgesia. Regional anesthesia, no question, really very important. Paracetamol NSAIDs, coccyps for peripheral sensitization. Alpha-2 delta ligands, pregabalin gabapentin for central sensitization, as well as NMDA receptor antagonists, systemic local anesthetics are working on central sensitization, alpha-2 agonists, and corticosteroids working on peripheral and central sensitization. Now, what I'm now not saying is the next patient you anesthetize, you should give all these drugs to, to achieve pain relief, because possibly that would be an overkill, or not possibly. Although, I can tell you there's an interesting study just published out of Hong Kong, where they were looking at gastric sleeve operations for bariatric surgery, and you know these patients, you don't want to use an opioid, and they've used nearly everything which is on this list in one patient, in all of their patients, and 65% of them went through a gastric sleeve uh, operation without any opioids in the perioperative period. So you can possibly get to a nearly opioid-free analgesia, but I don't think at the moment we know enough to recommend that. <clears throat> what I think we know enough is regional anesthesia should be used whenever possible because they are pretty much side effect free. They cause nearly perfect analgesia and we, for example, have now a regional anesthesia service in our hospital where a consultant and a registrar are available throughout the day and can come into whatever theater and help you if you haven't done the block or advise you on what the best block is, look after you while you do the block. And this way we are promoting more regional anesthesia than ever in our hospital. <coughs> in practical terms, we are currently giving all patients paracetamol intraoperatively with induction IV, because there are good data to justify that. We are giving COX-2 inhibitors IV on induction if there is no severe renal contraindication, and that's the only contraindication. We do not regard age, cardiovascular disease, or anything as a risk factor for using three to five days of a COX-2 inhibitor, and we have very good data to support that, but I can't go into the details here. And we use one single preoperative dose of pregabalin as a pre-medication around 90 minutes before all major surgery. We are continuing it in the post-operative period if there's an increased risk of neuropathic pain, and that will be the topic of my second lecture. In selected patients, we are using low-dose ketamine infusions, in particular opioid-tolerant patients, <coughs> patients with neuropathic pain. We use systemic local anesthetic infusions, lignocaine, in theater and recovery room, but not on the ward, for patients who cannot have epidurals or regional anesthesia, and we are using alpha-2 agonists, clonidine and dexmedetomidine, in particular if agitation or opioid withdrawal are components. So that's multimodal analgesia, the current level of evidence, very briefly. I could spend another five hours going into all the details, but they didn't give me that time. The other issue I want to discuss, because it is also something which happened over the last 10 years, and where there is now very good data, is that we know that chronic pain after surgery has been completely underestimated. 
and that in particular severe chronic pain after surgery, more than 5 out of 10, is something which occurs after all operations and some of them with relatively high incidence and has a major impact for the quality of life of the patients affected, but also for health costs of these patients and for the economy. And therefore, we need to do more about it. Now, what do we know as a evidence at the moment? We know that chronic post-surgical pain is more common than could previously thought and may lead to significant disability, again, strengthen. But clearly, this can only be level four because this is not RCTs. This is large care series of up to thousands of patients. And very important, and we come back to that in my second lecture, chronic post-surgical pain often has a neuropathic component. Now, what's interesting, and in particular for those of you who are pain medicine specialists, we always talk about the socio-psychobiomedical concept of chronic pain, and we have actually turned the curriculum. So we don't say biopsychosocial anymore because we think bio is so unimportant that we now call it socio-bio, uh, socio-psychobiomedical in our curriculum of the Faculty of Pain Medicine. But interestingly, the same is true for chronic pain after surgery. So patients who go into the operation with my major anxiety, in particular with pain catastrophizing, with depression, psychological vulnerability and stress, have a much higher chance of developing much more severe pain after surgery. And if you look at other factors, then it is patients who go with chronic pain in a surgery, back pain, joint replacement, will have an increased risk than those who don't go with chronic pain in there. Patients who in the first 72 hours have severe post-surgical acute pain, and that could well mean that they are already developing the neuropathic pain in that stage, which will then become chronic, but it can also mean that they are so vulnerable that they report higher pain scores, we don't know that, will develop significantly more chronic pain after surgery. And finally, important for our surgeons, intraoperative nerve injury seems to be a factor the problem is you cannot cut in human beings without injuring nerves. And therefore, we need to find more clever ways of covering that. Can we as anesthetists do something about that? There is only one drug for which there is evidence on a, in a Cochrane review that perioperative administration reduces the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. But even that is... Uh, this ketamine data is clearly at risk of bias due to a large number of small trials in this Cochrane review. We know that epidural analgesia following thoracotomy, again level 1 Cochrane, and paravertebral block following breast cancer surgery are the two regional anesthetic techniques for which there is evidence. And we know that there is complete confusion about pregabalin and gabapentin. There are meta-analyses which say this is a miracle, and there are meta-analyses like the last one, I think, from Scandinavia, which says very clearly there is no effect on chronic post-surgical pain. So we had to leave that as uncertainty and only as a tick box and not as a key message. We are still fascinated by ketamine, and we have been extremely lucky. Our group has just got a 4.6 million Australian dollar grant, and we will actually randomize 4,800 patients over in Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong through our clinical trials network between 72 hours of ketamine infusion, low dose, and placebo infusion, and then look one year later if we can really achieve a reduction of chronic pain by this approach, because it is the only one for which there is at least meta-analytical evidence in favor of that. And I want to finish with two brief comments about the issue that everything we see in lots of guidelines is for every surgeon. So they take paracetamol in every surgery and then analyze it. But we need to realize that an analgesic may have different efficacy in different surgical settings, and there's actually level evi one evidence for this. And that is quite obvious if you think that different pain states, for example, hip joint replacement versus colectomy, have totally different pain diagnosis. So musculoskeletal versus visceral pain, they have different severity of pain, and that means we need to use different drugs in different operations, and they are clearly in different locations, which means one block might work for one, but not for another. On the basis of this knowledge, some of you might be aware that actually driven initially by Henry Kehler, there is a worldwide initiative prospect, which has a, runs a website, and we only run a website because what we present 
completes continuous update and cannot be put in a book. You will see it when you go on the website. It's multi-multi-layer. And what we do there, we are offering procedure-specific evidence-based guidelines for the management of acute pain after a selected range of operations. The dream would be to do every operation, but this is financially and time-wise impossible because each of these is a very, very hard effort. And when you have reached the end, you need to start updating the beginning because by that time so much literature has come in again that you need to catch it. If you want to go into one of these, you can read everything. Every meta-analysis we did in this book, every single study which went into it with the abstract, or you can be really lazy and go to the algorithm at the end, which gives you more or less a flow sheet here for non-cosmetic breast surgery, for what should you do with a patient who is getting this. And here you see the typical result for breast surgery. They are very good data. Patients should have a preoperative gabapentinoid as a pre-medication. They should have a paravertebral block. They should get a COX-2 inhibitor and paracetamol on induction. They should have a general anesthetic and then multimodal oral analgesia in the postoperative period. This is now not evidence for every operation. This is the specific evidence from the operation of mastectomy. And this is for all our operations in this website. I want to come to an end because we want to have time for discussion. I hope I could show you that the current mantra of post-operative pain medicine is initiate multimodal analgesic techniques. And it has three rules. Minimize use of opioids. Maximize use of non-opioids. That does not only mean paracetamol and NSAIDs. And uh, use regional anesthesia whenever possible. And if you want to learn more about evidence-based, procedure-specific pain management guidelines, these are the Australian guidelines, free to download. This is a PDF of the American guidelines, and this is a website where you can find all the prospect recommendations I mentioned. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.